Welcome to the IIS Executive Panel on Leading the Great Reset. My name is Alex Machowski. I'm the Chairman of Marshall McLennan International. This is a seasoned and powerful group of individuals who run large companies. Mario Greco, Group CEO of Zurich, Kevin Strain, President and CEO of Sun Life, and Chris Townsend, CEO of Allianz Global Insurance Lines. The moderator is a colleague of mine, Mick Maloney, partner of Oliver Wyman, and Global Head of Insurance and Risk Management. We're all looking forward to their insights, perspectives, aspirations, and concerns. The planet and us, 8 billion humans, face greater risks than ever before, at least since the Second World War and the financial crisis of 2008. There's a huge protection gap. Many individuals are underserved or excluded. Let's hear what these decision makers are thinking of around the, the VUCA world that we live in, their growth agenda, and their risk mitigation plans. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Mick Maloney. I'm a partner with Alpha Wyman, and I lead our uh, insurance and asset management uh, practice globally. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by uh, three industry uh, CEOs, uh, uh, Mario Greco, CEO of uh, Zurich, uh, Kevin Strain, CEO of uh, Sun Life, and uh, Chris Tanzend, uh, who is CEO of um, Allianz's Global uh, Insurance Line. So, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us this morning. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, discussion. Um, so, as, as we do with this panel uh, every year, we, we have what I think should be an interesting bird's eye view of, of the issues uh, kind of facing our, uh, our industries. And, and um, to start with, I, I think we, I, you know, we, we just wanted to start with this, this question of, of the fact that we're operating in, in what is a, um, an extremely dynamic environment uh, in terms of you know, geopolitical risks, uh, at least partially prompted by uh, the war in Ukraine, kind of downstream consequences of that in, in terms of uh, you know, a very volatile inflation and, and macroeconomic uh, outlook. Um, residual uh, issues still with, uh, you know, the kind of questions as we emerge from the pandemic as, as to what uh, permanent or semi-permanent effects of, uh, of that might be. Uh, and obviously then a, a very volatile uh, kind of pricing cycle as it relates to the, uh, the kind of property and casualty sector. And, and certainly I think a view that we're heading into a, uh, a very interesting time, particularly as it relates to cat and property uh, kind of renewals at 1-1. Uh, at so I, I, I think the the, the opening question for our, our panelists this morning is, is how are you as kind of CEO of your business thinking of balancing those risks and in particular this question of managing for growth versus value as, as, we, uh, as we head into the, uh, the next year or so. Uh, and as, a, as a, an adjunct to that, if, if you would, uh, you know, if, if you could just set the table in terms of what you see as, as the most important issues that our industry is, is, uh, is facing as a result. And uh, Maybe we'll start with you, uh, Mario, if that's uh, if that's okay, and and uh, then move to uh, move to others. Thank you, Mick. Um, our philosophy is to carefully manage uh, uh, the volatility of our PNL and balance sheet. Um, so for us, uh, risk management and uh, risk accumulation is extremely important. Um, we have invested a lot in data and modeling. Um, and we drive to business uh, having in mind that uh, we want um, the PL and the balance sheet to remain in given brackets, uh, which means that uh, growth really does not matter. Uh, but uh, even value, non, it doesn't necessarily matter for us. So what really matters for us is the stability um, of the business. Um, out of the risks that you mentioned, which are all relevant, um, I would also like to add uh, two more, which we're extremely concerned about. And one, of course, is the weather, natural catastrophes. Um, and we've been working very hard on uh, um, reducing the exposures that we have to natural catastrophes. Um, and, uh, and then the last one is cyber and uh, the risks in this digital uh, uh, society that uh, we've been building. And again, we've been very, very careful in uh, accepting exposures uh, to um, cyber events. And we try uh, hard to model the consequences of possible events for what we can understand today. Uh, but uh, again, the, the fundamental principle for us is data management and, and risk uh, um, mitigation based on the data. Um, and that for us comes uh, first uh, and foremost uh, compared with uh, growth and even value. 
Thank you very much, Mario. And, and a, 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 a comment on anything else you, you see as kind of important issues for the industry as, as we head into the um, the next 12 or 18 months? Look, I, I you know, we, we don't think that inflation is something that it's really new to the industry or something that we're not prepared for. And we have inflation in a number of markets uh, in the past years. Um, so it's a well-known game. And, uh, and so we don't, we don't especially fear that. Um, you know, beside the war, which, 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 is, which is a huge uh, unknown, uh, the two things that um, worry us the most are uh, the weather and, and then cyber. Got it, thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, any comments from you? Yeah, maybe just to build on Mario's comments, it's definitely more uncertain times than we've experienced uh, probably since the global financial crisis. And so the, the strength of your balance sheet, the strength of your capital, the diversity of your business is actually pretty important. So that's something that uh, uh, we've always focused on and we've always had that financial discipline. But I think uh, in today's world, it, it's, it's more of a challenge. Of course, some of those challenges are things like higher interest rates and where the interest rates are today, I think is actually a more normal place. I think the, the anomaly has been the last five or 10 years, not where we are today. And I agree with Mario, we, we've, we've learned how to um, deal with inflation. As you, uh, as you all know, I, I ran Asia for five years. Inflation wasn't a, a new thing. Higher interest rates weren't new things there. So if we know how to work in that environment. In the Western economies, uh, Western countries, what you're seeing is the baby boomers are starting to retire. COVID changed uh, a lot of different things. And so you're seeing labor shortages, which you don't necessarily see in Asia. Uh, and not so much at the insurers. Um, we're able to work virtually pretty, pretty well through COVID, but at other, other companies where they maybe want people to come back or maybe they, they let people go during during COVID. They're, those those industries are having a hard time starting up. So there's a bunch of sort of things that are different than we've seen in, in the past, right? So in the, in the past, uh, central banks were able to increase interest rates and, and that controlled inflation. But because of supply chain issues, energy crisis, maybe even food crisis in some parts of the world, labor shortages, I'm not sure that interest rates increasing is going to be the, the final answer. So, you know, that, that strength of your balance sheet, the strength of your capital are, are really important. But at the same time, um, coming out of COVID, the purpose that we have as an industry of helping our clients with their financial security, helping them with their health, it couldn't be more important than it is today. So you talk about like, balancing growth. We do think there's growth opportunities. In fact, I think we've done close to uh, 15 different M&A transactions during uh, the COVID time. Uh, in fact, we did our second biggest one ever. We bought a company called DentaQuest uh, in the U.S., which is in the dental insurance space. We're seeing a lot more activity on the health side. Uh, we're seeing people more interested in their health. Uh, and with the volatile markets, you see people thinking more about financial security, long-term financial security. So I actually think there's uh, sometimes these, um, these moments where things are shaken up, for the companies that have strong positioning, it will give us opportunities for growth. So finding that balance, maintaining the strength of your balance sheet and capital, but also finding places to, to grow, uh, I think there'll be opportunities over the next uh, number of years. Very interesting. Thank you, John. The, um, Chris, the, the additional additional thoughts from, from you and Allianz's uh, perspective? Yeah. Yeah, look, you wouldn't expect me to say a whole lot different to what Kevin and Mario have covered off already, but obviously this uh, sort of trifecta of Low growth, uh, rising rates, and uh, and the, um, the the rising inflation. Couple that all with the the geopolitical uncertainty. This um, this sort of effectively a, an economic war situation that we have in in Europe right now, which we see day to day in terms of um, government's reaction. All underpinned by climate change. It's one of the most challenging uh, situations for us to manage through in a generation. No question about it. But when you boil it all down, it's about balance sheet resilience, basically. So. Protect the balance sheet, make sure you have good operational excellence, um, probably some, some aspects of keeping your powder dry. Um, I take Kevin's point in terms of opportunities, absolutely. Um, but there will be um, a ton of flow on from this. So it's, if you keep your balance sheet in, in great strength, you can take advantage of the opportunities going forward. And for us, it's a lot of focus, uh, continued focus on our, our customers and our people. Our people obviously have had a, 
super challenging time personally and got to make sure they're they're fit to fight so to speak as well and the, the sort of the way we look at the somaliance perspective is one where we're diversification is our friend in a situation like this so we have three big pillars around life and health asset management and pnc not all are going to be great all the time so that diversification both globally and by segment helps us and the sort of the the equation we look to in terms of value is really it's a combination of the growth the margin expansion and the, the capital efficiency so on the margin expansion um it's a continued focus as i say in terms of the operational areas definitely in terms of expense and we've taken expense down like half a half a half a percent for the past four years and there are a lot of growth opportunities going forwards from a risk perspective i agree with mario netcat cyber and i think from an economic perspective obviously the flow on impact to a lot of the emerging markets a lot of the focus is on the developed markets but the emerging markets are going to take a ton of pain out of this so I, I'd like to uh, transition us now to uh, to uh, this question about um, industry relevance and uh, and growth prospects. So we, we've spent some time already talking about the fact that we're all operating against a very vibrant background for for risks and a, a lot of unmet needs on the part of uh, corporate and individual customers as you uh, as you kind of look at that landscape. So. In one respect, you, you might think that uh, we're sitting in an industry that is kind of growing very rapidly and, and seeing a lot of uh, kind of transformative growth occur. I, I think you can contrast that with the fact that, uh, you know, a, a lot of incumbents are trading on uh, kind of high single digit, low double digit uh, price earnings multiples, which seem to paint a different uh, view of investors perspectives of, of where the industry is growing. So the question I think for the uh, for the panel is, you know, do, do you agree that that much greater growth is possible for the industry uh, kind of beyond what we've already talked about? And if so, you know, what would it take uh, in order for that growth to occur, particularly against the background, I think, where shareholders have gotten used to a lot of return of capital rather than reinvestment of capital on the part of uh, the part of insurers? Um, so maybe, maybe, Kevin, if we could if we could start with you on that one and, and then uh, go to others. Yeah, you know, coming out of COVID, I think uh, our purpose, Sun Life's purpose as a company is helping our clients achieve lifetime financial security and to live healthier lives. And everybody's more aware, as I was saying earlier, about um, the need for protection, the need for long-term investing, the need to look after your health. So I actually see three really big growth areas going forward. Uh, the first is, of course, Asia. Um, you know, we see um, growth uh, strong growth in Asia, developing economies, developing middle market, the need for financial security, the need for uh, protection products, the need for long-term investing, and, and an interest in health. Um, the, the second large growth market we see is in the health space in North America. Uh, the growth in the interest in, in health and in health insurance in businesses alongside that help people manage their health uh, we invested in a virtual uh, virtual healthcare company called Dialogue here in Canada uh, that helps people manage their health, which was really important during COVID when people couldn't necessarily get into the doctor. We've invested in the U.S. in a company called Pinnacle Care, which helps you uh, manage your health if you've had a, a health incident and finding the right care and helping you assess the care. And so health, we think, is, is a big tailwind particularly in uh, developed markets like uh, Canada and the US. And then the third is long-term investing. Uh, as insurance companies, we've had experience investing in alternative assets, in, in real estate, in infrastructure. And we've, we've been building out our, our capabilities on that front that we're taking to our, our, our retail clients and our institutional clients. So I think there's lots of growth that, that's linked back to our, our purpose. As we said uh, earlier, um, the, the the market conditions are, are much different than they were, but in fact, in a way, that they lend credibility to what we're trying to do. It, it, it's, it's telling people to, to think long-term, to think about protection, to think about different aspects of their plan. So, you know, we see, uh, we see tremendous uh, growth opportunities for the industry in all of those areas. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Canada, because our head of Canada always says, don't forget, Canada's a growth engine. And Canada... Uh, is, is the home base of, of Sun Life. And, you know, the Canadian um, uh, has a very, very um, strong immigration program. Uh, we've seen the population go from 34 million to 38 million over the past 10 years. You're seeing uh, a lot of growth in a lot of different areas of, of the economy. And so we even see growth in, in our core sort of Canada business. So I, I think there's growth to be found. Um, and I think it's very aligned with our purpose. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Chris, did, did you want to do you want to give us your perspective? Sure. Uh, look, the risk has never been more on the front page than it is now. And this uh, I think it's a fascinating time for our industry. And that's across governments in the boardroom, um, NGOs, everything. So it's actually a really interesting time to be to be in our industry. There's a, a few sort of buckets or themes. Um, one would definitely be this sort of ongoing um, convergence of life, wealth and asset management, uh, which we see all around the world. Uh, and that's exacerbated, obviously, by the shift from, which again is an ongoing trend in terms of the government sort of pushing everything onto the private sector. So well-placed organisations can definitely take advantage of that. And there's you know, very significant um, growth opportunities there. Um, the, the second one is this big, this broader sort of situation in terms of capital reallocation. If you think about it from a PNC perspective, um, you know, there's going to be a significant portion of the um, the gross premium which will disappear from our industry as people go through this net zero approach. That, however, will be replaced with a wall of new capital in terms of green technology, and there'll be a whole range of new solutions, opportunities, and services that companies can provide there. So I'm very excited about what the, the industry can do there. Obviously, we've got to manage the, the, the downside of that in terms of the, the climate change piece around the, the, the convergence of the modeling between sort of near-term net cap modeling and longer-term climate change modeling, because that's, a, that's a, you know, just an awful lot of work that needs to be done in that space. And the third area for me is around, around cyber. You've got this really significant imbalance between supply and demand. You've got infinite demand. Everyone wants it, but there's just a, nowhere near enough capital to, to go around to support it right now, obviously given the systemic risk that that sort of product or that, that area brings, brings to bear. So a lot more work needs to be done around that area. If you, if you look at the numbers, I think something like about one and a half trillion um, is the, the the number last year in terms of cyber crime. Yet the industry is like about twelve billion of revenue right now. So you can see the disparity, but you can also see the growth opportunities if we can find a way through that. So we're actually quite um, we're quite buoyed by some of the growth opportunities in the market right now. Mario. Okay, so I'll try to move uh, to something that hasn't been mentioned by Ken and Chris, and it's not easy, uh, but. Um, <clears throat> We're very keen to look also at new services and new opportunity to deliver to customers uh, product services that we have not delivered in the past. Uh, now, a digital offers this opportunity. Uh, so especially when you talk about uh, connectivity um, and uh, uh, device protection and extended warranties for the numerous devices that uh, we all use and we all uh, bear. The second area where we see a lot of growth is on customer loyalty. Uh, the industry is running around 80% uh, uh, customer loyalty pretty much everywhere. A few markets have higher. Of course, my home country, Switzerland, does have a very much higher loyalty, but generally speaking, 80% is the number. Now, there is space there. Every point of loyalty is extremely important and represents an important source of growth and a very sustainable and profitable source of growth uh, for us. Um, and then, uh, yes, I do agree. So I just, I am, I'm going to repeat, but because I want to stress the fact that there is a strong integration now between uh, life and health. Um, and uh, um, as, as, as it was mentioned before, um, you know, COVID has exacerbated uh, the need for um, the health uh, uh, coverages to uh, be bundled into life. Uh, and uh, we also see a lot of demand for well-being um, services and uh, um, well-being solutions, uh, which we think will, uh, will foster growth in the next years. Great. Thank you, Maria. The, um, so a, a, a kind of a, almost a, a question along somewhat similar lines, but it, it, it's been a... Um, a tough decade, I think we'd all admit, for balance sheet businesses, particularly asset intensive uh, balance sheet businesses with, uh, you know, you and, I, I, and others uh, looking to kind of rotate capital from uh, uh, kind of capital intensive models to capital light models, such as asset management and, and uh, that's as, as you've mentioned, Kevin, and, and uh, some of the areas that we've, uh, we've touched on. And, and then what we've Seen at the same time, I think, is the emergence of kind of private equity backed uh, balance sheets kind of happy to step into some of the more uh, balance sheet in, uh, intensive spaces. But the, the question um, 
then is, you know, as you think of the, the mix of, you know, more capital intensive balance sheet and, and kind of less intensive uh, businesses that you have today, how do you see that focus uh, kind of shifting and the and the mix shifting as we uh, as we move forward and and maybe um, Chris uh, maybe I, I can start with you and and then uh, then move to others. Sure. And look, the, the, I'd start by saying there's no sort of defined target mix which we would uh, state for, for for the group across the board. As I mentioned earlier, we've got great diversification by by products and segment across the the life and health, the, the asset management, and the PNC. So. We see, we see lots of opportunities um, and obviously the mix of that in terms of the return on capital you can develop differs by geography and, and by segment um, pretty significantly. So we'll be, um, we'll be looking very closely as we have done already in terms of the, you know, the, the, the legacy liabilities on our life books. We've done a number of um, pretty significant transactions there which have worked out really well for us and positioned us well, in terms of being able to reallocate that capital to, to, to better producing areas. Um, we think asset management's got tremendous future for us going forward. As I said, on the PNC sector, um, obviously there's the, 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 the broader question of auto longer term, but that's, that's really longer term. Um, I don't think there's going to be a significant change in the mix of that in the next sort of five to 10 years. We're obviously doing a lot around electric vehicles and self-driving vehicles and the like, um, and we're, we're developing good value propositions there. So I think what you'll see across particularly the retail sector is probably a push more into non-auto sectors. Across the commercial business, it will be continued penetration across SME and the mid-core is the sort of focus of what we're doing, as well as some of the areas of growth I mentioned earlier on. And then that that, that continued convergence of the the, the, the life, the wealth and the asset management, I think gives great, great growth prospects for us. So all of those um, are attractive. We've got a pretty pretty fixed target in terms of 30% ROA, which we articulate to the market. And uh, we spend a ton of time making sure that we we get the majority of our, our entities up and over that and uh, focus on the ones that are. So that's where we sit right now. Thank you, Chris. Hey, uh, Mar Mario? Yeah, a, li a little bit of paradox uh, after 2008 is that regulators uh, everywhere forced us to run balance sheets with uh, um, a lot of capital there. And, uh, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, we've been all evolving towards capital light models. Um, for us, um, at Zurich Insurance, this is especially relevant because we run in Switzerland on one of the most uh, strict impunitive regime for uh, capital absorption. Um, and so we uh, constantly uh, look at ways in which we can go into more capital light solutions. Um, um, one one, one um, which is especially useful, important for us uh, over the past years has been growing into services for our commercial clients. Um, and we started with Risk Engineer, and then we expanded that into uh, cyber assessment, cyber mitigation, and then we went into sustainability transformation. Um, and now we, and this is probably one of the highest uh, growth area that we have uh, through our organization, and it's extremely light on capital. Um, the other area, which for us is a, a very important source of growth uh, in a capital light, uh, way is farmers. Uh, um, I don't know how familiar um, the people here are with farmers. Farmers is a mutual organization uh, which we run um, as management, but of course we don't own or participate to the mutual. Um, so we have a specific interest uh, um, um, which is represented by fees that we receive for the size of the business. Uh, but we don't have the uh, capital volatility uh, which can be provided uh, uh, by uh, the events that happen. Um, and that is an important source of growth for us of premiums, uh, fees, um, and, and, then, and then revenues. Um, it, I don't know precisely how this will continue to shape in the future because uh, we're all running with uh, very... Uh, um, I would say heavy um, balance sheets with lots of capital there. Um, all of us have been doing, um, you know, buybacks and trying to reduce the capital through that. Um, I still dream. I'm born optimistic that one day the regulators will uh, 
give us uh, uh, better solutions uh, um, for especially the investment part of our books uh, because uh, um, uh, we're still uh, we're still struggling to find on the asset side um, you know capital light opportunities that uh, allows us to match the duration of the liabilities um, and that remains a continuous discussion with regulators um, and on one side uh, in Europe um, in the US, they want us to invest on long-term assets. On the other side, they punish us uh, with the capital models if we do it. Thank you, Ryan. I know the uh, farmers' reciprocal structure in particular is uh, the envy of several others in, in, the, uh, in the industry. So they, um, uh, Kevin, Kevin, maybe I could, I could ask uh, you as you answered the question to, to touch on the extent to which you've seen the kind of private equity influence as well on on some of the uh, some of the balance sheet side of things, but you, you, your view, your view. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, well, we've and the like has been on this journey since well, 2011, maybe but a little bit before that, where we've been either closing or selling the more capital intensive businesses, and and today our our mix sits at about 50% insurance and wealth, and the wealth would include um, our uh, our pensions businesses in both Hong Kong and Canada. 30% sort of um, group benefits and more short-term insurance, a lot of Asia is, is a shorter duration, less, less capital intense, and only about 20% in the more capital intensive sides of the insurance. Uh, and in fact, we just uh, we just sold a big piece of our uh, closed block to Phoenix uh, in the UK and took back an asset management partnership. And that's the types of things we're trying to do is to create that, that balance. I think that um, where we do have more capital intensive businesses, it, it's really linked to our, our purpose and where we have other pieces of business that we're selling to that client base like Canada and, and like Asia. So you get this, this better mix and this better diversification. So, you know, we're well along on that journey. I, I think the getting down to, to 20% is probably a pretty good place because there is still a role for those products. And I'd agree with Mario, I think finding ways to, make sure that the regulators and the capital rules understand the long-term investing alongside of the long-term requirements and, and making sure that's well understood. But, uh, but we've been on that journey for a while. Um, as, we've, uh, as you look at um, um, on the asset management side, one of the things that we see, and it's Mick to your, your comment, you're starting to see asset managers in the alternative space like uh, Apollo and Athene like Blackstone, like Brookfield, they're actually buying closed blocks because they want the cash flow. And so we're very aware that we've got an asset management business, 50% of our income, and we've got an insurance business, and we're looking for ways to make sure we, we synergize between the two of those and that we, we take advantage of that. And, and in fact, we think we're, we're pretty good homes for <laughs> the blocks that we know that are providing cash flow to our asset management. So we're pretty careful around doing that. And that's why we structured when we sold the closed blocks to Phoenix, it was important that we took asset management back. And not only did we keep the assets we had, but we structured a strategic partnership with, with Phoenix uh, going forward. So that's the, that's the balance point you're seeing. And you are seeing certainly private equity firms and alternative asset managers that are very interested in the, in the cash flow coming out of these more capital intensive uh, insurance businesses. Thank you, John. The, um, so I, I, I might um, shift us to a, a different topic, which, which is this question of, um, you know, uh, investment and digitization in, in, in particular. And I, I think all of you, and, and it seems like kind of uh, m most folks in the industry have a very significant uh, kind of investment agenda in digitizing uh, kind of the, uh, the enterprise and, and this question of what it means to be a digital insurer is certainly something that we see kind of coming up uh, very regularly. I, I think at the same time, you can look at where investments are occurring and, and see that a lot are still focused on kind of run the business rather than uh, kind of reinvent the business, which to some extent is, is kind of a natural thing. But the, the other observation I'd have is that it is still, you would think that one of the results of digitization would be that we would see more economies of scale uh, kind of uh, observable across the industry, which are in fact very hard to see. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like there's a, a kind of very direct link between kind of unit cost and uh, and scale for uh, for insurers. So I, I think the, the, the question uh, I'd like to just explore for a few minutes is, is just how you're thinking about that 
inve digitization investment agenda and the balance between kind of run and change uh, and also, you know, kind of challenges and also things that you're uh, you're most excited about as you uh, as you look forward. So, so maybe Mary, we can we can start with you and and then move around. Yeah, um, it's a great question, Mick. The first thing I'd like to start with is uh, a digitization offers a completely different means of contact with the customers and offers possibilities that we never had before. If we think about claims, I mean. Uh, but a few days ago, we had a uh, um, storm in Florida, and uh, uh, we've been inspecting right away after uh, that uh, with uh, drones, uh, with um, uh, low altitude uh, planes, the damages and helping the people there understanding what happened to their properties. That was unthinkable years ago. Um, um, AI on claims uh, is an incredible service for customers because it allows us to settle claims uh, uh, in, in a matter of minutes sometimes and definitely in a fraction of the time that was needed before. Um, the um, digital uh, opportunities that uh, we uh, um, can have by servicing customers um, through connectivity, again, is absolutely um, unthinkable uh, for the old way of uh, running the business. So this is the most important revolution for the industry, and this is the most important uh, priority um, that we have. Now, how to do it? I mean, you rightly pointed out that there is something about uh, um, standardization and globalization. You cannot innovate in uh, every local business. Um, you know, traditionally, all of us run, especially retail businesses, on a local basis. And we had uh, uh, a multitude of uh, different systems, uh, um, you know, depending on jurisdictions. It doesn't work uh, with innovation. It doesn't work with cloud. Um, I mean, since a couple of years ago, we had a single cloud for Zurich around the world, um, and we innovate centrally, and then we uh, deploy the solutions uh, in the countries, um, and there is no alternative to that. So uh, progressively, we are establishing um, global platforms, even on retail, and that, that's definitely uh, very helpful. Um, the second, the second challenge that comes with innovation is that the skills must be very different. Um, you know, the traditional IT skills of insurers are not uh, the ones needed if you want to digitalize the company. So we've been hiring, um, you know, teams. So we've been buying IT companies. Uh, we've been acquiring um, these uh, skills in the market. Um, and, and this is very beneficial for the organization. In terms of the balance between, uh, you know, how much we spend on the legacy, how much we spend on digital. Look, I mean, the, the, the real concern for me is how much we waste on both. Uh, because traditionally on IT, the industry has been wasting an awful lot of money in complicated projects, uh, uh, which uh, we all did and, and um, very often also with a lot of, uh, um, advisors, consultants uh, uh, to help us understanding these systems and adapting them, and very rarely I've seen the returns of them. Now, digitalization, um, again, is a very different game because usually you spend much less and the returns are much faster. Um, and so the real, the real problem for me is not the investment in, in digitization where uh, we're going as fast as we can, and, and the constraint there is not the money, it's more the people and the skills, as I said before, but it is how fast can we get rid of the burden of these uh, extremely heavy legacies uh, with all the costs uh, um, related to them and all the uh, delays that they um, um, call on us and the customers uh, for their uh, very complicated way of working. Thank you very much, Maria. Um... Kevin? You know, this has been a journey the whole industry's been on for a while. And uh, in fact, just prior to COVID, about three years ago, just over three years ago, we kicked off a project called Digital Enterprise, which was around helping us think and act like a digital company. And then COVID came along, which, which really forced us to move more quickly and forced the industry to move more quickly. But it also created adoption. It created different ways and regulators to look at it. In, in a lot of our markets, Regulators wouldn't allow for a digital signature, and COVID forced them to uh, allow that. So COVID sort of accelerated this, but the digital enterprise for us had three elements, and it really was about 
changing how we run the organization to think more like a digital company. The first piece was, of course, modernization of the tech stack. That was well underway, but using more cloud computing, Nero talked about that, using more API, uh, creating a little bit of more of a centralized set of skill sets to deliver on some of that, that work. So that sort of modernization of the tech stack. The second stream was how we work, creating a way that the business and IT work more closely together, that IT understood the business together, pushing the uh, decision-making down closer to the client, having a more agile approach. So smaller projects, uh, smaller deliverables, decision-making closer to the client, more like, a, more like a tech company would operate. So we've been training our people, shifting to that. Not, not all of our projects will be that. Some of them are big waterfall projects like IFR 17, but we have other projects that we're, we're doing in a more agile basis. And, and then the third element is thinking more about client journeys and listening more closely to our clients, spending time listening to the clients, and then finding ways to use um, digital relationships or partnerships. I mentioned dialogue earlier, where we put a virtual a care company right into, and we offered it to all of our group benefits clients in Canada because we wanted to accelerate how we're doing that. So finding ways to work with health tech, insure tech, fintech uh, uh, businesses, thinking more about client journey. So we've really been on a, a process to look at it from modernizing the tech stack to changing how we, we work, IT and the business together, to this concept of getting much closer to the client, thinking about client journeys and extending into partnerships. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, Chris, uh, maybe I can uh, ask you for the uh, the last uh, answer of our uh, of our time together. I know we're we're, uh, we're we're approaching time here, so over to you. So, and look, Mario and, and, and Kevin have uh, said uh, a lot of things uh, in common, and, and I totally agree. It's about the customer. So it's about the customer output at the end of the day in terms of their satisfaction, because they certainly have choices. So we measure that intensity in terms of NPS. We have eighty percent of our businesses above market and 60% are loyalty leaders. And we're, that, that's a journey we've been on for, for, for a number of years and we're super, super proud of that. The, the actual process of moving um, in terms of this, this balance of run to change is really, really difficult. We spend, I think, about four billion a year on technology. Uh, we haven't got the balance entirely right yet. And there's obviously the, the challenge of double run costs until you can decommission some of the legacy technology. And that's, uh, you know, that's for all the large large companies, be it life or gen, experience exactly the same issue. So we're working through that. I think we're making, making pretty good progress. We'll be spending an awful lot of time developing these, um, these sort of verticalized platforms. Um, we used to do things 50, 70 different ways around the world, which um, was just, wrong in terms of um, the, the disbenefits of the, 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 the lack of benefits of scale really across the organization. Um, so we've got these now working pretty well on the retail side on the front end, we're doing it on the commercial side on the front end, and then we're, we're making some pretty good progress across the, the back end piece as well, which all of that will help speed to market and take a ton of cost out of the equation. The other thing we're, we spent a lot of time working on is how we interact with a lot of the um, the newer technologies and other companies are, are around the world. So we use Allianz X, which is a, a captive fund to invest in some of these entities and then work with them. Um, so companies like Coalition on the cyberspace or Pi and the Workers' Comp or, um, or um, Control Expert, which is sort of a, an image recognition company helping us on, on auto claims. We invest in those companies uh, and our challenge is to make sure we don't we don't kill them with Alliance love, basically, but we take a lot of the skills and uh, protect the culture of those organizations to bring a lot of what their capabilities are into. And that's, that's working well for us. And it's, uh, as the other guys have said, it's a, it's a journey for all of us. Thanks very much, Chris. I, uh, so I, I know we're at, we're at time, so I, we, we, might, uh, we might close things out there. And, and, and uh, thank you uh, again. I, I can't imagine a, uh, a better panel discussion to uh, to set up the the theme of the great reset for the uh, for the company. So uh, from uh, IS and and uh, from me, thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Hello again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the panel. I thought it was extremely interesting, and I gathered a lot of information, took down a lot of notes. I basically divided the the content uh, into four buckets. One around growth, one around volatility and managing the balance sheet and PL. One about the role of the regulator and how regulators could help growth. And finally, the role of digitization. And 
how all these help us to grow in a VUCA world with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So <clears throat> volatility. Clearly, there's a lot of focus on using data, um, to some extent uh, modeling, in order to figure out how to deal with capital and risk. One of the companies focuses more on protection of their balance sheet and their P&L, and the others seem to still do that, but have a more of a, a, a lean on growth. Um, where are the opportunities for growth? Well, certainly life, health, and financial security asset management is one area which seems to be loud and clear in the conversation. Client connectivity through digitization, the Internet of Things, getting close to the client, understanding, getting client intimacy digitally, artificial intelligence, the use of drones in claims, new capital light services. Cyber disparity really came out really loud and clear when we heard that there were one and a half trillion dollars of losses last year and only $12 billion in premiums. That's a huge disparity, which if one can handle the endemic risk is one of huge possibility. We heard about Asia, we heard about North America as potential high potential growth areas. I've actually been in India just recently and with a regulator who wants to double the penetration of insurance in India in, in ASAP. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I strongly um, endorse that, the, the, the opinion around, around Asia. Digitization obviously brings you closer to the client, but it has raised some questions. One is around running the business as well as opposed to changing the business. Running the business and basically digitizing legacy uh, programs is not necessarily a, a profitable activity. And yet we are faced with the fact that we do have to have standardization. We are faced with the fact that we do have global companies and that we need to take whatever is being handled by those legacy um, programs and put them into new digitalized uh, systems as quickly as possible. There's discussion there about the waste uh, of money and time and for clients and a waste of money for companies around these legacy systems. And I think that's pretty, pretty important. I was impressed by also by the comment about being fit to fight, which was used actually for clients, but I would say that's also true for companies. The opportunities to buy companies, to move from heavy uh, capital needs to lighter capital needs by providing services and, and, and less capital heavy uh, types of uh, uh, solutions is, a, is another growth area. So finally, I heard uh, from, from the speakers uh, that there is a, a need following the, the heavy load of capital requirement that the regulators put uh, on us uh, from after the financial crisis of 2008 for some kind of relief and some kind of growth agenda from them. Because it's true that companies are moving to try and find capital light services. The fact is, we have a lot of people who are uninsured and who deserve insurance. And so to find a way that for a more uh, amenable regime for, uh, for capital would I think allow for that growth and allow the un <coughs> underserved to be served. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.